allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please call the roll. Councilman Brink is excused. Councilman Morrow? Here. Councilman Kitchen is en route. Councilman Secreto? Here. Supervisor Quigley? Here. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the special town of Ulster Town Board meeting as a lead agency public hearing for the Lincoln Park grid scoping session. I ask that you note the exits to your left and to your right, and if necessary, and we are required to evacuate, please do so in an orderly manner. Uh, tonight, the purposes of this meeting is for the scoping. The purpose of scoping is to narrow issues and ensure that the draft EIS will be a concise, accurate, and complete document that is adequate for public review. The scoping process is intended to ensure public participation in the EIS development process, allows open discussion of issues of public concern, and to permit inclusion of relevant, substantive public issues in the final written scope. This is a statement that is directly taken from the DEC regulations related to scoping. Scoping is the process that develops a written document scope which outlines the topics and analysis of potential environmental impacts of an action that will be addressed in a draft environmental impact statement, a DEIS or a draft EIS. At this point, um, I'd like to point out, I've asked for sign-in for those who wish to speak. The sign-in sheets are at the podium. The town clerk will collect the sign-in, a sign-in sheet. There will be other sign-in sheets behind it. You can continue to sign in if you wish to make a statement. We will call the speakers to the podium in the order in which they've signed in. We are asking that you try to keep your comments to three minutes or less. We will have a timekeeper, and depending upon the number of speakers and the amount of time consumed, we may be able to allow people to come back to the podium after everyone has been heard. And I say may, it depends upon the hour upon which we finish. There will be no yielding of time from one speaker to another. So you have three minutes and everyone has a chance to sign up. With that being said, this is not a town board meeting. And no decisions will be made that require a vote of the town board. So there are no issues of notice of votes on the agenda. We will vote to open the meeting and we will vote to close the meeting. With that, I would like to allow Glide Path to make a short presentation for those who have been unable to or wish to hear the uh, narrative again. And at that point, this will be about 10 to 15 minutes. We will then proceed to the public comment and I will ask that people come to the podium as they're called again to speak about the issues that they wish to see studied. Um, my name is Dave Young with Chazen Companies. We're the site engineers working on a project. We prepared the EAF, uh, the, the document that's here. Uh, there are copies here at the table as well as available out online. Uh, Peter Rood is with uh, GlidePath, and he'll be presenting uh, exactly what the project entails, uh, the purpose of the project, and uh, how it's going to be tying in with the local uh, electric grid. Uh, I'll just go through the site real quick. Uh, off of Frank Satil Boulevard is where we're going to have our access point, very near the intersection of Myron Lane and Frank Satil. Uh, we have about a 500 foot long access drive into the site and the site itself is up here. Total impervious acres, um, acreage is about 2.3. Uh, we've really condensed it down since we initially submitted the EAF. In the EAF you'll find it's 3.09, but we've shrunk it down as much as we could. 
and still accommodate the facilities that need to be on the site. Uh, the total area of disturbance is about 5.32. Uh, that's a little bit larger than what's in there, but that's based on spreading the stormwater out so that there's less of an impact um, uh, from the drainage aspect of the project. Uh, the overall project is here with the various components. And again, Peter will get into these in more detail, but uh, from, the, from the main portion is uh, access drive around the entire site with the uh, gas fire generators in the enclosed building here with the exhaust stacks for the generators. And then the uh, supply of gas will come into a gas uh, conditioning metering area from the uh, main that goes through and cuts across Frank Sotil. Uh, that connection is right here. And then the electric connection for the site is right adjacent to it on the substation. Uh, a backup fuel supply for the generators is uh, diesel uh, fuel. There's a 50,000 gallon uh, tank for diesel fuel here completely in, contained within a uh, containment dike and uh, you know there's a, a loading area here that's also protected from any kind of spills that possibly happen as they're downloading the diesel. Uh, over here is a 180,000 gallon fire water storage tank for any eventuality there. Uh, and then over here is the battery systems uh, which Peter will go into in just a minute. Um, and then uh, uh, the inverters that take the power from the batteries and then get it into the uh, electric substation. With that, I'll turn it over to Peter. And uh, if you can. Great. Yeah, so I'm going to try to here. balance my position here between the screen, which is in the back here, that's the floor is mounted, that's where we're going to have to have it, uh, and close it up here so that the, the, the court reporter can hear what I'm saying. So, um, and these slides will all be available on our website at the bottom there, uh, as are these drawings. So um, if you're looking for any of this stuff, it's, it's all there. If it's not there right now, it'll be there by the end of the night tonight. Um, my name is Peter Rood. I head up development at uh, GlidePath, and um, we are the sponsor, uh, owner, developer of this project. So I'm going to go over uh, a little bit more detail about what the project purpose is and what it does and then link that back to uh, what David was talking about, the actual project site. So the purpose of the project uh, is to do three broad things. Uh, this is a uh, electrical generation system that is designed to provide uh, certain reliability services to the electric grid. Uh, so it provides services to uh, Central Hudson and other utilities that are connected to the New York ISO uh, which is the grid operator of the large wholesale power market in New York. Um, we're not intending to provide services directly to consumers. We are a wholesale uh, power producing project. Uh, and so we provide, we're, the reason we're doing this is, is threefold. One is that these services are required to operate the grid. Anybody who uh, consumes electricity from the utility system uses the services that we'll be providing. Uh, they're required and necessary to operate the grid uh, safely and reliably. Uh, the reason the lights are on tonight are partially because of these services. Um, and they, they help supplement uh, the generation that's provided by large generators, small generators, that they, what you think of as typical power plants, wind projects, solar projects, nuclear, coal, large gas plants. They generate energy. Our project is, is to help that energy uh, do its job and be delivered uh, to uh, the people that need it. And we think we can do it at a lower cost. We're competing in a free market in an auction style system. So in order for our project to be successful, uh, we need to do it at a, at a low cost. And we do that by having a very efficient system that uses uh, one of the most efficient uh, natural gas generation systems available uh, and pairs it with uh, lithium ion batteries to, to uh, further enhance the efficiency. And we think by combining those technologies that we will provide a, uh, these services for a lower cost and beat out current providers of these services that are currently in the market. Um, but it is an at-risk business. We're not uh, subsidized. We're not using any sort of uh, um, you know, government grants or services. Uh, we are a, a competitive project, and we have to compete with uh, others in the marketplace to be successful. Uh, and uh, because of the efficiencies that I just mentioned, 
our project will have uh, lower emissions than the current providers of these services and help further New York State's goals of reducing greenhouse gas emissions uh, by moving the ball forward and slowly reducing uh, the emissions needed to operate the power grid. So more about the services. So we provide uh, three services. Uh, one is uh, peak generation capacity. So this is a service that is uh, is like a security system. It is there to. Sorry, I need this a little closer. Thanks. Um, uh, it, it's uh, it's like a security system in that it, it is designed as a safety net to uh, to be available if a uh, another generator goes down or if a uh, emission line goes down or or if there is a an unexpected need for power. Uh, so that is what peak generation capacity is, and, and that is one of our services, is that we will be available to provide <coughs> power when the load exceeds the expected demand. Um, and that, that will use both our battery capacity and our gas generation capacity. The next service is what's called frequency regulation service. Uh, this is the minute by minute or even second by second adjustment of uh, output from our plant to uh, correct for changes in uh, either load or generation. So as people turn on and off their lights, as uh, businesses turn on and off motors, refrigerators, as uh, renewal, renewal plants change their output, uh, that all changes the, uh, the, the dynamics within the grid and that needs to be balanced. And so we will do that with frequency regulation service. Uh, we expect that service to only be provided by our battery system and will not use the gas generator. The final one is what are called spinning reserves or fast responding reserves. Uh, fast responding reserves. Uh, so these are the ability to, uh, this, is, this is kind of the real time ability to be able to turn on instantaneously if needed. So uh, the capacity service is, the, is kind of a broader scale, the fact that you exist and are there able to provide the services. And the, the, the fact that you are providing the services is what's called uh, spinning reserves. And so that's the ability that if there is uh, a power line that goes down, or if there is another generator that trips offline or has a, a, some other sort of unexpected decrease in output, uh, we can come online within seconds to provide uh, power and, and minimize the disruption and ideally prevent an outage. Uh, these services are all being provided right now by other projects in the area. These aren't new services, and everyone in this room that uses the electric system from Central Hudson or another utility uses these services every time you uh, consume electricity. Uh, what we're not doing, and what this project is not designed to do, and what our business model does not contemplate, is providing long-term generation of electricity. Uh, unlike uh, what you may think of when you think of a power plant that turns on in the morning, runs all day, turns <coughs> off at night, or some combination thereof, we're <coughs> not intending to provide electricity all the time and earn substantial amounts of revenue by generating electricity. We need to generate electricity to provide these services, so, so we are going to generate at certain times, but the value in our plant to the grid is the fact that we can be depended on to generate very specific amounts of electricity at very specific times on command. That's the service we're providing, uh, not just to generate power to further supplement the power being consumed. So the demand for this project isn't that there's new electricity needed in this area, it's the fact that these services are needed to run the grid around any, everywhere, and, uh, and, and we think that, that our plan is a more efficient, lower cost way of doing it. Uh, more about the Pacific plant components. Uh, so the project will consist of two major or main generation components. There will be uh, a battery system. Uh, so there's an example of a system there that can be containerized batteries. Uh, so batteries, lithium ion, uh, a, a version of lithium ion technology. Uh, Generally the same technology as in cell phones, computers, that sort of stuff. That same general chemistry scaled up to, uh, to utility scale and type and put in containers like this. Um, and what these do is these provide short bursts of power uh, very, 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 very quickly uh, to react within seconds. Uh, it can also absorb power. So a 20 megawatt battery system uh, is, is in reality a 40 megawatt swing capacity. Um, and, 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 and we'll use these not, not like you use your phone that you charge up in the morning, discharge it at night. We will use these by managing charge throughout the day and be, being able to, at a moment's notice, both consume and generate power back onto the grid. Um, so that's, that's the battery system. Uh, working together with the battery system is what's called a reciprocating engine. Uh, so these are uh, 
again, simplifying for the sake of time, uh, very large car engines. So they use the same technology. Uh, they have multiple cylinders. The cylinders uh, have fuel injected to them. They compress the fuel. There's a ignition, and that uh, that drives a shaft in the middle that then drives a generator. Uh, that's this. So this is just a much bigger scale than within your car. Um, and uh, and the beauty of these things is that they they're not necessarily designed to run for long periods of time. Again, that's not what our intention is. But they can start really quickly. They can see, they can slow down really quickly. Unlike traditional gas turbines, which are based on uh, the jet engine technology, uh, these are much more flexible to, to turn on and off, and they have much fewer, or many fewer requirements than a, than a typical gas turbine does. Uh, they will run, uh, run off of natural gas as a primary fuel. Uh, we will, as Dave mentioned, have on-site diesel fuel as a backup uh, to, to allow us to operate or, or allow us to meet the requirements. Uh, in the event that natural gas is disrupted to the site, which uh, happens occasionally in this part of New York. Um, and because we're a new project and subject to various uh, New York and federal laws, we will have to install state-of-the-art emission control systems, uh, so that will capture emissions coming out of the engines and, uh, and reduce them to, uh, to levels that meet the, uh, the various requirements, and in many cases go beyond those requirements. That's the engine system, battery system, major components. Um, so the site, so zooming in here, I did over this a little bit, maps are up here, again, these maps are all on our website, these are the same maps we've been using for the last several presentations, so this isn't anything new really. Um, this is where we're at, we're kind of behind the Hudson Valley Mall, just for the sake of clarity, this map is oriented, so to the left, or to this side, towards the Hudson Valley Mall is north, so it's not north up, it's north to that side. Um, so uh, that's this that there. Uh, so you can see our little white box. Watch your eyes turn to white. Your white box right there is the uh, is the project site uh, within the project. Uh, there are some measurements here in the maps that you can find on our website. Those you can see all those a uh, little, little less, about 700 feet from the property line here to the to this development, this home development right here. Uh, substantially more to over here, and I forget what these numbers are, but a few hundred feet to the road itself there. Um, that's the site. Right now, the site is uh, is, is is zoned. Uh, uh, Office, office manufacturing office and residential. Uh, it's a privately owned parcel. There's no deed restrictions, no anything on it. So um, uh, it is developable uh, and, uh, and zoned properly. And uh, in our one of the things that we've, that we've talked about with the town doing is, is besides the area that we're developing here, uh, actually putting a deed restriction on the property to, to make the remainder of it uh, forever green. And so that's part of the proposal here. Uh, and, and restrict further development of the site. Uh, zooming in to the That's site hilarious. here some more is, uh, is kind of this, the same, same thing that's up there, also on our website. Um, and uh, you have power, the existing overhead power line, Central Hudson here, uh, existing underground gas line there. Uh, this is the Frank Steel Boulevard right there. We'll have a site entrance and then our, uh, our footprint right there. Uh, we do have one wetland crossing right there, which is a, uh, a, 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 the federal wetland wetland crossing with the entrance road. Um, Kind of getting closer, this is the actual site itself. Uh, so in the middle there, you have the uh, the engine system. It'll be in a in a uh, in a, build, in a building, um, and uh, the same building will have the engine set up. It'll have control room and uh, some candle shop area. Uh, there will be some exhaust stacks. Uh, we've been some confusion here. We'll have we'll have two separate uh, flues, so to say, but there'll be one stack structure. So there will be a, a single, when you're looking at it from, from kind of outside the property, you'll see one structure, you'll have two flues in the middle, um, but uh, we're calling it one stack for now. Uh, and we're looking to be between 60 and 80 feet tall, uh, and as we go through the EIS process and do our studies, we'll refine that number. Uh, so that's the middle there. Uh, the battery system is over here. As I mentioned, the batteries are containerized, so there'll be a lineup of uh, shipping containers, uh, and, and they'll, they'll contain the batteries uh, and inverter systems. Uh, have gas supply, this is where the gas will come in from Central Hudson, it'll be metered and everything right there. Uh, backup fuel, the diesel fuel I mentioned, single tank uh, with containment around it located there. And, uh, and the grid connection, this is where all the electric, electric components come together and get connected to Central Hudson system. Uh, so that is the broad overview of, 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 the, um, of the, the project site, kind of zooming in and the project purpose. Uh, we have a lot more information on our own website, Lincoln Park uh, Grid Support Center .com, all pushed together. Uh, we also have a project email that if you want to ask us questions, that's the email address, and we have a 
hotline. It's a local number that rings a number of us that glide path, and uh, and we uh, try to try to get back to people within a few hours if if we don't answer the phone when you call. Um, so that's the overview, uh, and I, I think that concludes our presentation. Yeah, that's so we have prayer. I have a motion to open the public hearing. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Would you please call the first name? Yes. Sandra Pearson. <coughs> My name is Sandra Pearson, and I live in Ulster Gardens Court. I have not seen any mention of this. Uh, I live in Ulster Gardens Court, and although it is shown under the legend label on this map, I have not seen any discussion of this. Ulster Gardens Court, for those of you who are not aware, is 161 units of mostly elderly or disabled individuals, many of whom already have COPD or other breathing conditions. I am extremely concerned about emissions. And when I see the final report on this, I would like to see how those how the downdraft and how the downdrafts work out from that thing. It's a very dangerous thing for those of us who are elderly. In addition to Ulster Gardens Court, within two miles of this this uh, structure, you are going to have the birches, you're going to have seven greens, and other such multifamily units, all of which are aimed at the elderly or disabled individuals. This is an extremely fragile group of people, and I really need to know that they are going to be protected. So, your specific point, your specific I, request, is that the EIS study cover what topic? It cover the the uh, spread of emissions from this facility. Okay, that that's the out. That's not downdraft. Downdraft's this way. It's this way. Well, whichever it's going to be, we're going to be we're all, we're about a half a mile away from it. So, spread downdraft. Whichever. Thank you. <laughs> Jeff and Zavino. Thank you. My name is Jeff and Savino, Director of Land Use Advocacy for Scenic Hudson. We'll be submitting more detailed written comments on the draft scope by the March 22nd deadline, but tonight I'll briefly highlight our main concerns. Alternatives analysis. The alternatives analysis lies at the heart of SEEKER, which requires the lead agency to certify that from among the reasonable alternatives, the action is one that avoids or minimizes adverse environmental impacts. Therefore, the draft EIS must evaluate feasible alternatives, including not only alternative sites, but also alternative technologies. This section of the draft scope is inadequate and should be amended to include alternatives that achieve the stated purpose of the plant, but by using other technologies would lower, would result in fewer environmental impacts. These technologies should include standalone battery storage as well as a solar facility that's coupled with battery storage. Visual analysis, in addition to the visual impact of the plant and stack, the scope should include an evaluation of the visual impact of its plume. This analysis should be based on modeling of worst case weather and wind conditions. The scope should also include methodology for visual assessment that includes a visibility map and computer generated simulations made during leaf off conditions. Air emissions and climate change. The scope must include a thorough evaluation of cradle to grave greenhouse gas emissions and consider the facility's potential to emit based on the plant operating 24-7. Without a permit limitation on diesel use, it's possible that the plant could run primarily or exclusively on diesel if the natural gas supply is disrupted. The applicant has stated that the project will help integrate 
renewable energy resources into the grid and therefore will help reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The scope must include a thorough and objective evaluation of this claim from both a local and statewide perspective. Fiscal impact. The scope should include a fiscal impact analysis that includes costs and benefits for each jurisdiction impacted by the proposed scope. This analysis should include any potential subsidies or pilots, costs to emergency response teams, and the impacts on property values of nearby residents. Extension of comment period. Seeker provides that the applicant and lead agency may agree to extend the 60-day time period to issue the final scope. For particularly complex or sensitive projects, such as this gas-powered power plant, this is often necessary to ensure that the final scope can address all issues. Um, finally, if I have just another second, I'd like to thank the town board for holding this uh, scoping meeting. We know it's optional and we commend them uh, for convening the public here uh, to get their, uh, their scoping comments. Sina Cutson urges the town to explore with the applicant such an extension of the co comment period. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Can I those are you, that, your written comments? Yes. Okay. Sorry, I should have Do you have that multiple first. copies? I have a couple uh, extra copies. Thank you. <clears throat> Regis? I want to say his last name. Wojcicki? Thank you. My name is uh, Regis Opajeski, and I live at 170 Ledge Road in the town of Ulster. Uh, scoping is a time for questions. Mine will refer to only two areas this in the interest of time, safety, and emissions. Uh, they are preliminary and merely foreshadow a more comprehensive version to be delivered on or before March 22nd under safety. From a safety perspective, why would the sponsor propose a fossil fuel fire plant, mostly unmanned in the middle of a forest, which may be, uh, which may be subject to external threat from natural causes or vandalism? Under the seeker rubric of unforeseeable catastrophic impact, has the sponsor planned for the possibility of such an event and assess the likelihood of its occurrence? CRRNY 6179. Ulster County uh, Department of Emergency Management documents refer pointedly to wildfires. Quote, areas typically considered prone to wildfires include large tracts of wild lands containing heavier fuels with high continuity at steeper slopes, particularly those that are far away from firefighting apparatus. Unquote. If the sponsor does not avail itself of the Ulster County's disaster preparedness services, what objective methodology will it use to perform a hazard analysis, a vulnerability assessment, and a preparedness plan for fire involving high-pressure natural, natural gas, 50,000 gallons of diesel, and 121 acres of biomass bordering a residential area? Under polluting emissions. Uh, why did the sponsors uh, full environmental assessment form EAF Part 1 omit identifying and quantifying any emissions whatsoever, D2GII? What is the science and its sources behind the information that the lead agency and the seeker uh, reported in EAF Part 2, identifying six toxic emissions and their quantities of impact? Please show the full worksheet. On January 17th, GlidePath reported on slide 8 that uh, CO2 emissions from their plant are 195 pounds per megawatt hour. What is the science and, and its sources behind that information? Is 195 pounds still correct? Since extrapolating the 195 pounds to an annual tonnage rate for the plant running 24-7, 365 is 17,000 tons of CO2. What is the sponsor's... 25 seconds, sir. Thank you. What is the sponsor's uh, number of the threshold of, quote, more than 1,000 tons a year of CO2 in EAF Part 2? Uh, and lastly, uh, what is the science and its sources behind the emission numbers of the other five toxins? What is the calculation method relative to the threshold? Uh, and does it use 247365? Please show the worksheet. Thank you. Can I have that paper as well, sir? Are those your complete comments? Or are you going to supplement them before the deadline? Oh, I'm going to supplement. Yeah, okay. they're not complete. Thank you. Yep. Thanks. 
Donna C. <coughs> Canoe? It's Donna Canoe, and I was going to request that I yield my time to Laura Hartman. I'm Prior sorry. To you. I'm like sorry. The rules are up front said no yielding. I, so I have no comment at this meeting. Thank that you. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Let me finish. Judith Karpova. I'm a resident of Ulster County, and I believe that this project affects us as a county and not just this town. What, what's your address, ma'am? I'm 213 Sundown Road, Kerhonkson. Okay, so I've just been doing a little research. Uh, the Economist says that. Um, Every year there's 50,000 gas leaks from natural gas uh, over the country. Forbes magazine calculates 3.6 trillion cubic feet escapes of methane escapes into the atmosphere annually. How about explosions? 3,200 since 1987, which involve fatalities, hospitalizations, or $50,000 or more in damages. There's 500,000 fracked wells in the United States right now. So whether or not there's even the slightest puff of emissions escaping from this particular proposed plant. Take your hand off the mic and just talk. Okay, from this proposed plant, it's part of a network of natural gas around the country that's dumping a ferocious amount of pollution into our atmosphere naturally. Why is this of concern to the entire county of Ulster? Because we have some of the cleanest air in the state. And it's much easier for a project like this to get approval where they're not adding to an already heavily polluted environment. So it would be much harder for them to get approval, say, downstate, because it's already polluted there. But we have clean air here, and we've worked hard for that. And we prize it, and it's a source of our tourism and many other uh, economic benefits. But it also apparently makes us a dartboard for companies that can use us to exploit our clean air and pollute it and be able to be permitted to do so. Thank you. Uh, before you sit down, this is a hearing for specific requests for study within the EIS. Within your statement, do you have a specific request that you can articulate to us that is concise, that will help us formulate our study. Um, let me give it some thought and email it in. Is that okay? Open comments are uh, welcome by email, yes. Thank you. <coughs> Vicki Lucarini. Good evening. My name is my name is Vicki Lucarini. Vicki turned it off. I did? Yeah, there's a button down below on the uh, base. Yeah. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Vicki Lucarini. I live at 170 Ledge Road at Ground Zero. Here are my questions that I am submitting tonight that have to do with the town zoning laws. However, this is not um, the, the um, complete list of my questions and I will be submitting more questions before the March 22nd deadline. First question, how does a proposed project protect the natural and man-made environment of the town, protect the character and integri integrity of established residential areas? Second question, how does a proposed project prevent incompatible uses and preserve all property values and recognize the special status under law of the single-family dwelling. Third question, 
Has the project sponsor decided on the useful height of the two smokestacks? There were different heights discussed, 70 to 100 feet. Does the range of 70 to 100 feet meet the zoning requirement not to exceed 10% of the building height? All of this has been referenced to the zoning laws. Lowell, things? Uh, my name is Lowell Thing, uh, 188 Ledge Road, Town of Ulster. Uh, I have several other comments that I will submit in writing, but tonight I would like to focus on my most important comment. My very strong feeling is that I do not want to see any additional pollution added to my air or anyone else's, and I don't see a need to do that. Yes, I do recognize that currently the national and local energy grid could not exist without burning fossil fuel, with the consequent contribution to the atmosphere of harmful amounts of carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, methane, and other pollutants, the further consequences of which have already harmed the planet in very alarming ways, ultimately harming people in, as well in very alarming ways. Today there are better alternatives, and in fact, GlidePath's other projects provide examples. Every compromise we make at this point is a step backwards when we should be investing in alternative energy sources. And Please hold your applause till the end. Incidentally, I do not accept DEC or any other agency's explicit or implicit reading of a low, meaning acceptable, level of pollution. Air pollution in any amount is harmful especially considering that the effect is cumulative over any given area, local or global. So my specific suggestion pertinent to uh, section Roman numeral nine of the scoping document, alternatives, is that the applicant present an alternative that does not include the use of natural gas or diesel fuel. If that includes the possibility that New York State can change current regulations to make this feasible for GlidePath economically or in any other way, as I understand uh, such a possibility exists, then GlidePath should determine what specific changes are needed to regulations or other law, assess a realistic time frame for this possibility, and provide such other information as might make this possibility become a reality. If local lobbying and other citizen action would be helpful, that should be noted too. This alternative, the battery-only alternative, is the only alternative other than no project at all that would be satisfactory for myself and my wife, our neighbors, and I believe for everyone. Thank you. Suzanne Thing. Oh, hold on a second. Lowell, you only have one copy of what you spoke to? Lowell? Lowell? You only have one copy? Okay, I'm going to ask that, that you allow us to copy what you got before you leave. My name is Suzanne Thing, and I live at 188 Ledge Road in the town of Ulster. Under Roman numeral 10 in the scoping document, item B, it says that availability of alternative sites will be discussed I suggest that this item be extended to include alternative sites not just for the proposed project with natural gas, but for the all battery alternative. In other words, if the project could be built without the natural gas and diesel fuel, what other sites might be prefer preferable or possible? While I favor an all battery alternative, I am also concerned about the currently proposed site, which is not far from the Fox Run neighborhood in which we live. Between our neighborhood and Route 32, there is a considerable forest that supports a large bird population as well as deer and other animals. It's an environment close to a residential and business area that is both 
visually beautiful as well as a sound buffer, a natural refuge that mitigates our closeness to the traffic and business areas along the 9W bypass. The possibility is that someday this land could become part of a land trust, a possibility that development would invariably destroy. And so my second suggestion is that as part of the Roman numeral 7 item P, cumulative impacts, the applicant consider to what extent the proposed site will com uh, compromise the Town of Ulster's land use plan. That is, once a project is built on a proposed site, how likely would it be that additional sites will be built nearby, exposing this forest to further, further loss in future years? Thank you very much. Thank you. Squeeze out. Good evening, folks. Thank you, board members, for having us here tonight. My name is Vince Guido. I live on 153 Old Flatbush Road. Um, my comments will be coming in written before the deadline, and I have many of them, but too specific tonight to deal with. Um, one, most importantly, because there's so many flaws in the EAF and so many blank spaces in there under air pollution and quality, a big thing what we talk about is cumulative effect. Um, we have the big Callahan plant that runs on natural gas right next to this site. There has been no mention of this in, the, in any place that how much problems are with the gas down there when they cumulated this with this plant. So that should really be studied. Um, Glide, Glide Path has never built a fossil fuel project like this anywhere. Um, they're strong, they're, they're, um, they're, a re, they're a renewable energy source company that this is not the niche for them. Right now, NYSERDA is vigorously working to change the regulatory storage facility regulations. In New Jersey and California, just have changed their regulations to accommodate renewable energy sources. Glide Path in the town should take a short time out to see what changes come so we can move forward with renewable energy facilities rather than the gas power facilities. Both Glide Path, the town, and most importantly, the town's environmental and quality life would be a great goal for this. So please, let's take and see if we can table this whole subject for a little while and see what the state comes up with with renewable energy and how it could benefit all of us. Thank you so much. Is there a specific request of what section you want studied, or are you going to? I'll, I'll put that in writing right. coming up, Jim. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Susan Gillespie. Good evening and thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, I'm Susan Gillespie. I live downwind in Rosendale and I'm president of the Board of Citizens for Local Power. My statement tonight pertains, uh, my comments pertain to the possibility of viable... Susan, can you please back up just a little bit from the microphone? You're making a crack. You're Sorry, is, is this better? My comments pertain to the uh, possibility of viable alternatives and the question of economic feasibility of the project. The Glide Path project in its current form um, relies on natural gas at a time when rapid changes in the energy system make it increasingly economical to provide the services this project promises by using battery storage alone. The changes are coming hard and fast with two notable events in the last week that I will briefly describe. In this context, Glide Path's state-of-the-art system will soon be outdated, leaving the town and area saddled either with a fossil fuel generating plant that pollutes the community and is not needed, or with a failed project that has despoiled the landscape for no good reason. The two recent events I mention are, number one, the decision by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission on February 15th, ordering all state independent system operators to develop plans for integrating storage, including battery storage, at the transmission and distribution levels, and to develop rules for behind the meter battery storage. The order specifically overturns current limitations in New York 
by which until now NISO made it impossible to connect storage projects greater than one megawatt to the grid and to provide services other than voltage regulation. The FERC specifies that all ISOs, including NISO, must allow a storage research to offer, quote, all capacity, energy, and ancillary services that it's technically capable of providing, close quote. Minimum size may not exceed 100 kilowatts, which is way smaller than this. The ISOs have to sell um, grid energy to the storage, the, I'm sorry, the, the uh, storage facilities have to sell grid energy to the, to the ISO at wholesale prices and the other way around too. And since the storage facilities can both sell it back and provide additional services such as capacity or voltage regulation, this should be able to be profitable. The only limitations are that the storage facility must receive energy from and feed it back into the grid at either the transmission or the distribution level. All types of storage are allowed and should be treated equally. I see no provision that would prevent attaching renewable energy. And in fact, the second example was... 30 seconds. Proof. Just today, the New York Public Service Commission approved a demonstration project in Orange County that is being developed by Tesla and O&R Utility. It is all storage and will include four to eight megawatts of aggregated batteries, which will be located either behind the meter at commercial and industrial customers or co-located with distributed solar. With this kind of visionary project coming down the pike, the Glide Path and the Town of Ulster should be able to aim for the environmentally and ultimately economically better solution, all storage, without dangerous polluting natural gas or storage. Your, your three minutes is up. Can you wrap it up real fast, please? Or storage plus renewable generation. Thank you. Do you have written comments to submit? I do, yes. Thank you. And multiple copies or do we have? I have one we'll copy. copy. That's fine. I can also email it to you. Bring, yeah, your, bring your copy to me and I'll just make some copies. Please. Okay. I made some a couple of adjustments at the top, so I'll improve my handwriting and then I'll hand it to you. Okay. Dan Furman. Turn it on. Yeah. Oh, okay. So you touch here and it turns off. If that blue light is lit, it's on. All right, it's on. Can you hear me? No. 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 It's not on. I broke it. That's what happens. See if the wires are on. Yeah. All right, I'll just talk loud. You're not counting my three minutes now, right? No, no, no. <laughs> I was, but I'll start over. <laughs> Switch mics. No, I'm sorry. I broke it. Yeah, maybe. Good thing it wasn't in the model of ever having to broke up. Yeah. <laughs> you get simulation. <laughs> I'm not going to touch it. <laughs> we'll start now. Ready? Okay, yep, I'm ready. My name is Dan Furman. I live at 273 Risley Street, which is right across the way from where they're going to build. My concerns are the diesel part of their, of their proposed project. On page 7 of their EAF part 1, when they're asked about traffic in the area, and they state that the traffic will consist of a maximum of four employees and a maximum of one fuel delivery truck per day. And that's a maximum, which is fine. Who cares? One truck, big deal. But it occurred to me that that statement basically takes into case takes into account a worst case scenario the worst case being they don't have access to natural gas for whatever reason the natural gas is disrupted they would have one fuel truck a day again no big deal however are there other statements taking into account that they won't have that they might not have access to natural gas they're going to have 50,000 gallons of diesel on site in case they don't have natural gas. Now, they've spent a lot of time in their literature and such telling us how clean natural gas is. And that's true. It is probably the cleanest fossil fuel. 
Diesel isn't. We all know that. So they don't ever mention the diesel portion of this. When they're asked about whether the plant will produce odors for more than one hour a day, they say no. The only odors would be from the loading and unloading of possibly diesel fuel. But does it take into account burning diesel and burning diesel all day for a week or two weeks or even three weeks at a time? What happens to their numbers, to their to the studies, if that is the case? And I think that if they do have diesel as a backup, and they see the need to keep 50,000 gallons of it there, it's fair to ask that we see two sets of numbers in terms of emissions, in terms of noise from the generators. I don't know if it's the same generator running on the same fuel. I don't know about these things. I'm assuming it would be two different ones. Um, but for noise, for emissions, and for odor, I'd like to see both fuels taken into account equally. Even though they're going, they're saying that they're going to use natural gas more, they're primarily natural gas, but we have to go under the assumption that what happens if that natural gas doesn't flow for whatever reason, it doesn't matter what the reason is, but what happens if that doesn't flow? I want to know what happens with the diesel then, the, the odors, the emissions, and the noise. So that would be my area of concern, to give you a pointed area of concern. I don't have any paperwork to give you, I didn't do my homework um, for that. But I will email them or submit them before the 22nd. But my, but my specific area of concern is I would like to see the same effort given to the diesel component of this as is given to the natural gas in terms of emissions, noise, and odor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Did pretty good. Gloria Wesley. Hello, everybody. I'm a fairly new neighbor. I just bought a house on Pete Seeger's birthday, May 3rd, and I felt that that was a very good omen. I bought a house for my four blue and gold macaw parrot family, the Parrots for Peace. They are first responders for the 9-11 World Trade Center. They went down every day for several hours to cheer up people that were first responders. I have 20% of my lung capacity. I have severe COPD. I have tremendous asthma. And What's I, your address? 1107 Main Street in the town of Ruby. Right off Sheehan Lane. It's a 650 square foot little summer cottage with shale in the back that can't be used for anything. Anyway, I thought I had a small slice of possibility for the parrots to have a good home. The, if this monstrosity goes through, not only will I be harmed and have to move, but it risks their very lives because parrots are more vulnerable than even human beings are and the concept of cancer, lung disease, and all of that is not only concerning to me for myself and my parents, but for my neighbors, because it's not just about me, and it's not just about them. It's about all of us. They have a motto. May there be peace on Mother Earth between all people, all animals, and all of nature, as we learn to live in harmony with our one mother, our shared Mother Earth. Lori, is there a specific area that you're asking for? Yes, I would like to know what you're going to be doing to help people move, to get the adequate price for their house, because there's going to be a tremendous loss in property value. I want some kind of an agency set up to find places that are compatible and comparable to what we are losing in the quality of our life so we can find other places to live at the at same rate. And I would like to see that there's a healthcare system so people are regularly monitored and that there is liability for both this town and for the company to pay for healthcare and hospitalization and all of that for people who are vulnerable. That means children that are not yet born are going to be put at high risk. That means the animal population is endangered. It changes the whole complexion of Ulster County, which has recently gotten an award 
for a green county and increasingly is benefiting from tourism, yeah, I would right. personally go yeah, out of my way to tell people up. not to move here or come here. Thank you. Thank you. Marie Dolores Gill, I believe. Good evening. My name is Marie Dolores Gill, and I reside at 128 Fox Run. Oh, I'm sorry, 128 Quail Drive in Fox Run. Pull the mic down. Oh, I don't want to touch it. Okay. <laughs> That's the good one. We gave you the good one. Oh, thank you so much. Okay. Okay, I reside at 128 Quail Drive in Fox Run, and I've been there for 23 years. I have strong concerns regarding air admissions, climate change, and use and con conservation of energy. I understand that the purpose of this project is to generate electricity, <clears throat> mainly from combustion of natural gas. This will result in emissions of carbon dioxide carbon monoxide, and nitrogen oxides. The proposed plant <coughs> project may run a few days per year, although it could occur more often depending on the demand because of its availability to the grid 24 hours a day. On behalf of our community, I have the following questions. What is the actual annual tonnage of all six emissions listed in your Part 2 Environmental Assessment Form, assuming 24-7-365 operations. Second, how is the dispersion of these pollutants managed by smokestacks 100 feet high, 90 feet, 80 feet, 70 feet, and 60 feet? How does the height of the stacks affect the density of pollution for people living 680 feet away, 2,000 feet, 5,000 feet, or two miles away, as well as three miles away. <coughs> That's the conclusion of my questions, and thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Laura Hartman. Good evening. My name is Laura Hartman and I live at 45 Bird Street in the town of Ulster. I am making this statement on behalf of townofulstercitizens.org. Citizens are diligently preparing written questions and comments to submit before the 20, March 22nd deadline to the Town of Ulster Board as lead agency for full representation to the project sponsor. Submissions will include questions and concerns regarding health, safety, water and air quality, environmental impacts, residential property values, and reasonable alternatives to specific aspects of the draft scope. Local environmental and advocacy groups in our area that include Scenic Hudson, Riverkeeper, KingstonCitizens.org, Catskill Mountain Keeper, Coalition Against Pilgrim Pipeline New York, Citizens for Local Power, and the Sierra Club of the Mid-Hudson Valley have expressed concern about the potential environmental impacts of a proposal such as the Lincoln Park Grid Support Center, a gas-fired power plant in our town of Ulster. GlidePath, a relatively new company from the Midwest, has a portfolio of only battery storage and renewable projects. Their proposed peaker power plant in the town of Ulster would be their first fossil project, and it shows. The company misled us at their January 17th open house, grossly underestimating and then misquoting the emission rate in their PowerPoint as being 195 pounds per megawatt hour when it was actually more like 800 to 850 pounds of uh, megawatt hours. They spoke of the benefits to our community, but we know that the project would produce expensive peak energy for downstate communities while polluting here. Some statistics show that this single 20 megawatt gas-fired peaker plant will create roughly the same amount of emissions as the collective households in the town of Ulster in a year. Benefits? Our air quality index is good, and we can't ignore the fact that because of it, GlidePath's permitting process would be less cumbersome. That's a bitter pill for those estimated 137 homeowners whose life savings are invested. Properties located 
only approximately 600 to 700